Kia ora and welcome to the Manaki Whenua Link Online webinar. Um, today we're, uh, we have Bob Brown talking to us about uh, WASP biocontrol agents. But before we start, I just want to give you a, a few technical um, bits of information. If you have any technical issues, if you could just put them into the chat box and Tiffany, who's working away in the background here, will be able to help you sort those, those questions out. If you have questions for Bob that you'd like us to put to him at the end of the webinar, please put them into the same uh, chat box. Without any further ado, we'll, we'll kick straight into it. Um, Manaki Whenua has an extensive program of weed biocontrol which includes extensive research to secure the appropriate control organisms, ensure their safety and efficacy in the New Zealand environment, um, all the contingent EPA approvals, importing and rearing the biocontrol agents, and upon release, monitoring um, its progress and impact. Wasps are also an environmental pest as well as posing a threat to primary industries and human safety in our great outdoors. And so we've applied our biocontrol expertise to the problem and found two potential lifesavers. Bob Brown is with us today, not supporting sporting his special bee suit, but <laughs> he's going to update you on the progress so far and what happens next. Now I will come back at the end to um, put the questions and uh, to Bob, but uh, we'll leave you in his safe hands until then. Take it away, Thanks, Bob. Christine. Thank you, Christine. I did think about wearing my bee suit, but yeah, I thought that would be a bit weird. So um, yeah, today I'm going to talk about um, these two new species um, of biocontrol agents and why we chose them and what to expect in the future. So I, I wanted to start by um, just acknowledging all the people that have contributed to this project over the over the years. And as you can see, I'm not going to read all the names, but as you can see from the list, there, there's a, a wide range of uh, stakeholders from forestry to um, conservation to, to primary industries and, and councils. So um, that just shows that that wasps impact um, a, a wide range of different um, areas. So this is obviously a wasp, and in their natural range, they they provide a an ecological service. So they they regulate pests, like you know many many um, pest crop. Uh, pests of crops and they they regulate populations of these things and you know it's similar to to other predators in you know in a savanna or something like that however new zealand's history doesn't have any of these social um, social insects and i mean if you look at this thing it's 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 a beautiful insect it's it's nice and and fluffy it's sort of cute it's got a cool color scheme but whenever they they're in numbers, it's it's a different story, and so hopefully this video is going to work all right. Um, this is a video of a Germanica nest that I went and dug up the other day, and these can get massive. This this is a, a multi-year nest, and there's you know probably well definitely tens of thousands, if not. 100,000 workers in there and so in New Zealand these things can can grow much larger than they would in their normal um, natural range and that's what I'm, I'm going to talk about here um, next let's see so so why are they so invasive in New Zealand well one one thing is that they've their their life cycle is adapted. I mean, if you were going to design something to be a, a good um, invader, you would have have a, a similar life cycle to to these guys. So the the queens can can have a long overwintering diapause, and 
unlike a lot of other insects, she can she can go in and out of the diapause without um, too much of a of a problem. So she can, if there's a nice warm day in the middle of, of winter, she can wake up, she can go get some water and some some chi, and then then go back. You know, as the as the water or as, as the um, temperature cools down, she can um, she can go back into diapause. And their biology. So they're they're social, as you saw there uh, in the last in, in the last video that. They live in a, in, a, in a large colony and they've got a division of labor and some of those are guards, some of them are, um, they're out gathering food, some of them are gathering water, some of them are gathering pulp. Um, another reason is that they're generalist predators. So they're not very picky on their prey. Um, some predators are quite specific to you know certain groups and these guys, they, they can learn new, um, new sources of food. Um, on on this picture here, um, we've got this is a relatively new arrival to New Zealand. These are the giant willow aphids, and you've, we've got a um, a wasp back here. Um, these particular aphids actually come from the same home range as as the um, the two invasive Vespula that we have here. So it didn't take long for them to to find these guys and and exploit this resource. Um, they they go to these um, aphids and they eat the the honeydew just like they do in the beech forest. So also the New Zealand environment is conducive to these guys. Um, mild conditions compared to um, northern Europe and lots of honeydew. In the beech forest, there's there's tons and tons of honeydew. And now that um, these uh, willow aphids are here in New Zealand, there's you know a lot more honeydew that's available outside of the beech forest. And I, I touched on this earlier is that they've also come into New Zealand and there's an open niche. So there's there's no native insects in this in this family. So there's there's no native social wasps, there's no native social bees. Um, there's a, maybe a dozen or so um, native social well all ants are social um, so there's there's ants and there's there's a, a couple of species of termites, I believe. So when they got here, since there was no um, related species, there were no natural enemies that were adapted to, to prey on these. And this, the natural, no natural enemies is the only thing that we can really do much about. So in New Zealand, we've got six species of Vespidae. All six are introduced. Um, and Cistroceras is the little um, European tube wasp that you might see in your garden. It looks just like a, a very small um, paper wasp. And these um, just make little um, mud nests in, in tubes or any, any kind of hole in, in a fence or something like that. Three species of paper wasps um, and the two species of Vespula. And again, there's no native species in this family. The, the the nearest relative, well, not the nearest um, species that has a similar social behavior, um, nesting ecology and, and colony behavior is Bombus terrestris um, that we can um, have as an analog to, to look at um, any kind of um, crossing over of species. So how do we go about finding and choosing new agents. So um, not too long ago, uh, Phil Lester's group at Vic Uni um, traced the, the origin of the Vespula that we have in New Zealand to, to Northern uh, Europe or Southern UK. And so, so that's one of the, the most important things to get whenever you're starting to think of biocontrol is you wanna know the origin of the the um, the species that you have and kind of the ecotype because even you even though you might have the species in and say Russia for instance that not, might not necessarily be the same as the the ones that came from from the southern UK then we do a, a, a pretty robust uh, literature review so now that we've got the location we can look at all the different species that are related and kind of cross reference the um, the known histories, uh, life histories of these. Um, and while we're doing that, we're looking at host range and um, 
you know, what's got a similar ecology, ground nesting, um, cavity nesting. And then we, we go and do a survey. And so we, we, we go there, we get on the ground and we start digging up nests and, and just looking to see what's actually there. Um, just because something is, has been shown in the literature from 1800s doesn't mean that it's actually still there or, or having much of an effect. So that's, that's, that's my favorite part is going and doing the surveying and seeing what's, what's happening. And, and one of the benefits of having the, your invasive species coming from, from the UK is that there's, there's, there's a long history of, of people doing natural history there. And there's, there's a lot of different groups um, surveying things. You've got the, the hoverfly recording scheme, you've got the, the dipterists forum, you've got, you know, bees, wasps, and ants recording scheme. So there's, there's all these kind of citizen science um, interest groups. But also, um, there's there's been a long history of this um, national bee unit. So that's that's another resource that we can use um, because apiculture is such a huge industry in New Zealand. We want to make sure that we're not going to um, have any, you know, no chance whatsoever of of um, any biocontrol species crossing over to honeybees. So I, I got in touch with with um, some of the the researchers at, at the, the National Bee Unit in the UK. And they wouldn't give me access to their um, to the data themselves or myself, but they I gave them the, the names of species so that they could survey it or they could look to see what, what has been found in um, in nests over there. And so this this is was started in, in the 1950s. And since 2010, they've been averaging, um, surveying 35,000 hives per year. And that's mostly because of the American fowl, fowl brood that was introduced. So they, they do a lot more robust um, surveying. Before that, it was about nine to 10,000 hives per year. And so once I, I got my, um, my species list narrowed down and I, I came up with these two species, um, I ask them to, to look in their records and, and they've never found any, de any detection of either of these species. And while I was over in the UK, I also um, tested Bombus trustrus audax that um, you can buy commercially, similar to what you can do with um, bio bees here. And there was, there was no attack on the brood. So here's the first one. This is the hoverfly, um, Vaisala ananas. And these are brood parasitoids of Vespula. Um, this, this photograph was taken just, I mean, less than a meter away from a wasp nest. Um, so what, what she's doing is she um, locates the nest by sight and then she, she goes near it and she starts to groom herself. And um, I, I don't know if she's spreading um, a compound to um, hide herself or if she is just making sure that she doesn't smell like any flowers or something like that. So she'll go and um, groom herself. Then I watched her fly right down the wasp nest entrance. And then she came back out. I collected her in a pottle and then I put her in my pocket when I was digging the nest. And so in the, in the UK, these guys are in almost every single nest over there. So they, they were in 85% on average of, of the nests. Um, a little bit more in the, the vulgaris, and that might be just because of a sampling um, artifact, because I, I found a lot more of the common wasp um, nests than I did of the German wasps. Um, these have a high fecundity, so the females, um, you can see she's got her ovipositor sticking, sticking out, prepared to go lay eggs, and wild-caught females can have more than 600 eggs in them. As a hoverfly, she's an excellent flyer, so that means that she could disperse and actually out outfly some of the wasps. Um, and what, what's cool about these guys is that one fly larva feeds on multiple wasps, so that's you know that's a, a big deal. Where most parasitoids, you think of either you know a one to one, so one one larva feeds on one. Um, of the host, or multiple of the parasitoids feed on one of the hosts. So this is this is a, a, a strange. Um, it, it's 
it's, it's a quite a bit different than, than normal um, parasitoid um, behavior. And as you'll see here in a minute, they've got morphological adaptations so that the, the larvae um, are, are very well adapted to, to uh, move around the nest and to, to feed on the, the grubs of the, the wasps. And what was cool about this, this fly is I put her in a pottle while I was digging the nest. And um, speaking of adaptations, while she was in my pocket and she couldn't see the the wasps and so she, but she could smell them obviously and so she she dumped a lot of eggs in in that that puddle um during that that time so that was an interesting find so here's a a sketch of basically the general layout of a wasp nest and let's see if i can um get this to work so here's the entrance and we've got the um in the in the center we've got the comb and then this this cav the the comb is surrounded by a a paper cavity or paper envelope and the the fly will fly down to the entrance tunnel and depending on how busy the the traffic is of the colony she'll either lay her eggs in in this tunnel, or she'll she'll make it all the way in to to lay her eggs near the near the entrance of the nest and on the paper there, and then the the larvae will find their way into the um, into the the comb and begin feeding. So here's here's a close up of some second instar um, volucello larvae, and they're they're well camouflaged here. It's, it might be hard for you to, to see, but here's here's one of the the volucella larvae squeezing its way um, in between the the wasp grub and the the cell wall. And what she's doing, so this is the the, the dorsal side here. So she's going in with her belly out against this because um, she's got little uh, claws here on the on the underside. And so she'll go down and then she'll curl up underneath the bottom of the grub and um, she'll feed from below. And in this picture, you've got one, two, and here's another one here under this one. And here's a video um, some of you may have seen before. Um, if I can, how do I get rid of this? Um, so here's in the in the center we've got one of the the volucella larvae and um, just keep an eye on her and this this is a nest that you know as I'm dicking it up and so there's there's still workers around and they just they don't even care they just they see some movement so they go and investigate for a second but that that doesn't bother them at all and so these guys seem to either be chemically insignificant or they're chemically blended in and um, Here's another one to the left, and if you look up um, up in the upper left-hand corner, there's there's one that's actually under the the um, the cap of the the pupation of the of the pupil case. And sometimes they can be very numerous. This is a, another nest that I had just brought into the lab to to remove all the workers, and um, there's hundreds in this nest. And so each one of these is going to feed on on a, a, at least a couple of the um, the wasp scrubs. And yeah, I mean that's that was like a, a <laughs> when I found that nest, I was just over the moon. It was so cool. And so after they they fed on on the the wasp scrubs, they they transform into this third end star and then they drop into the bottom of the nest or they will migrate out and overwinter in the soil and they overwinter as as um, third end star larvae and then in the in the the next summer they'll they'll pupate and then um, will emerge as adults so this is just in the lab with um, some that i brought in and um, this is kind of a simulated you can see some wood wood chips and that sort of thing but um yeah, they're they're quite wriggly. They can move a lot faster than you can imagine. Um, but yeah, they're they're interesting little critters to work with. The next one is um, 
the Metaweakus paradoxus. This is a, you know, the common name is, is just the, the wasp nest beetle. Um, these have been studied in, in Europe since the late 1800s, well, actually mid to late 1800s. And there was a kind of famous um, argument between these, these scientists on the, the life history of these guys, and they finally sorted it out. It was a very public row between, <laughs> between these guys and the, um, the Royal Society. Um, these are brood parasitoids of Vespula. Um, they seem to prefer vulgaris. Um, they were found in um, half of the vulgaris nests that we, we studied or surveyed over the years. Um, we didn't find them in any of the Germanica nests over that time, but that's, again, um, I think that might be an artifact of not surveying that many Germanica nests just because the, the common wasp is more common over there. Um, and some other studies in um, more central Europe, they are found in about 7% of Germanica nests. So that's roughly about the same as what you would find Svikafega in German um, nests or, or any nests for that matter. Um, these have a high fecundity of up to 700 um, eggs and like a normal parasitoid, these one of these beta larvae consumes one, one wasp larva. And these are chemically adapted to to live in the in the wasp nest, as you can see by the antennae on this um, this male. So, uh, why am I showing you a wasp gathering pulp? So this this is a um, a vulgaris wasp. Um, they they come back to the same spots in the beech forest um, to to gather their pulp time and time again. Um, this is the second year in the row that I've seen seen them coming to the stump. And um, the Metaweakus will, the female, after she mates, she'll come to these these spots, these exact kind of spots, and lay her eggs in the in the crevices here because she can smell that this is where the, the wasps are gathering their pulp. And if you look closely, you might be able to see the, um, I'll just try this. Um, there's there's a little ball that the of pulp that this that this worker is going to take back to the to the nest to to build the the comb. So she'll come and lay her eggs here. They'll overwinter, and then the next year, the um, when the the wasps return to to gather pulp here, the the triangulin larvae, the 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 larva will jump onto the the wasp and hitch a ride back to the nest. And there, she'll um, the the larvae will become internal parasites of the wasp grub, and then they'll come out and become external parasites. And you can kind of see that here. Um, you've got a, a healthy wasp pupa on the right, and on the left hand side, you've got the the Metaweakus pupae or the Metaweakus larva at the bottom, and it's basically just draining the um, the the um, the vulgaris prepupa. So we also need to think about how these things have a wider effect on the ecosystem. And so there's there's nothing related to these these guy these two um, natural enemies in New Zealand. So there's there's nothing in in the 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 um, volucellid um, group, or there's not there's nothing. And the the Ripophorinae. So there's there are Ripophorid species here in New Zealand, but they are in different subfamilies or tribes, depending on on who you ask. Um, so we're expecting them to not share any parasitoids. So I mean, there there will be probably some some generalist parasitoids um, that that might be able to sneak in, like um, Melatobia. Um, they they can be quite flexible. That's a, an invasive um, species of parasitoid. Um, and since they're both brood parasites, we expect their impacts to, to be within the nest. So they're not out trying to catch the, the workers or um, anything like that. There, there will be some pollen and nectar feeding by the, particularly by the hoverflies. Um, but we think over time that that will be um, a minor effect. Um, some will be preyed on by generalist predators such as spiders and mantids. There's there's no getting around that um, just because they're good at their their jobs. 
And we, we think that any kind of indirect effects will be minute compared to what the wasps, uh, how the wasps affect the, the, um, the environment currently. So I, I guess now is um, a time to talk about expectations. Um, there are some benefits to biocontrol, like major benefits, and, and they operate on a landscape scale. And, and they are self-perpetuating once they're established. But, you know, like, this, like the title says, it's not a silver bullet. So the, the idea behind this, this program is that it would be part of a, a larger suite of tools like, like you would in any integrated pest management program for um, a primary industry. So these would do um, the kind of lion's share of lowering the population where other tools um, become more effective, such as mating disruption or localized chemical control. So mating disruption, um, just as a plug, I'm also working on um, looking at the sex pheromone of the wasps. Um, so mating disruption works more efficiently the lower the population is. So this is something that would work in, in concert or synergistically with, with the biocontrol. And so, um, so next steps. Um, we don't have any of these guys in containment at the moment, um, and we were unable to get any last year um, due to obvious reasons with with COVID and everything. So the next step is to get some of these agents imported from the UK, um, and to develop mass rearing techniques. The hoverflies themselves are notoriously difficult to rear in an artificial environment. So. Getting, being able to put them into um, a glass house with natural sunlight and, and that sort of thing will be instrumental to, to rearing these um, out of mass scale. And we need to sort out release sites. So um, we're, we're starting to look at um, what might be suitable areas um, climate-wise for these, um, these two species to establish. Um, the, and, you know, more on the expectation front, um, it, it's going to be small releases at first because we can only collect so many from the UK. And what we'll do is do a small release and keep some back to try to, to get mass rearing going um, here on a much larger scale because um, I'm, not, I'm not sure how, how serious a lot of people are about this, but to me, I think that to to move things along, we're going to need to release these probably at tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands per year to, to make a difference um, in a shorter period of time. Because biocontrol can be can be a slow process. And if you know you're just releasing a, a hundred here or a hundred there, it could take decades for them to have any noticeable effect. And so what I would like to do is um, mass rear these things on, on an enormous scale and release hundreds of thousands. And that way that could speed up the, the impact that they have on the wasp population. And also um, we'll, we'll monitor us, the establishment and um, that will be most likely through iNaturalist, um, develop a, a, a program within, I, uh, within a project within iNaturalist where anytime these are reported, then they'll, they'll um, come up on the, the um, iNaturalist site and get funding support. So that's that's where I'm at now. We're towards the end of this program. And um, so to, to jump up to the massive scale of, of the releases, we're going to need to get some funding support. And yeah, um, I think that there was 300 some odd people registered for this. And um, I doubt we'll be able to get through everybody's questions. So if you have any questions that we don't answer, please um, feel free to flick me an email. And um, yeah, thank you for listening. Great. Hey, thanks very much, Bob. That was really uh, a fascinating um, insight into the work that you're doing. And, you know, those next stages about turning this into something real so that it really is a, um, able to have a national impact, um, even if over time, uh, yeah. is incredibly important. So so we're yeah. at a crucial stage. It, it is... Uh, uh, lots of the science has been done, but but that those next stages um, certainly require some ongoing support. And 
you know, yeah. maybe some funding. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So if anybody knows any wasp hating philanthropists or or something like that, then please please have them get in touch. Yeah, that'd be great. Look, that would be great. Now we have had a few questions um, submitted, yep. but I'm also looking at the clock, and we're kind of out oh, of yeah. time. And yeah, sorry, you know, I, I ramble on. No, look, that that was great. I didn't want to stop you or stop those videos. It was it was really good. I'm going to have nightmares. Um, <laughs> look, I'd like to say a big thank you to everyone who did put in questions. We will come back to you directly, and we will also share the questions on our website. So the presentation and the slides will go up on the website. We probably can't put the video up uh, on the website, but it will come through in the presentation. So if you want to see all that, all of that again and scare the kids, um, that's your opportunity. <laughs> um, we will be back with another link webinar in April and look forward to uh, seeing you again soon. So thanks very much and bye for now. Thanks.